But, uh, all right, let's get started. So what we want to do today is testing with Max. I have to refresh this, actually. Uh, so we want to do testing with Max, which the big question has been, what the hell are Max? Including from TAs and Paul. This is new content in the course. So, uh, um, so that's been the question of the week. What the hell are Max? And uh, let's talk about it. So for, for your uh, application objective one, this is related to the second application objective, or application task. The second application objective in application task one, we've got to introduce more vocab here, uh, is testing with Max. For this, you're given, a, uh, you're given code that uses a database, a MongoDB database server, and I don't expect anyone, any one of you, any one of the TAs or Paul to understand the MongoDB database code or to spin up a MongoDB database and connect to it. You do not have to understand the MongoDB code at all. Uh, that's not part of the expectation. And with testing with Mox, as we'll see, you don't have to understand the implementation to be able to test if your code uses that implementation properly. So that's what we want to do. So don't panic when you see all that code uh, for MongoDB. I'm never going to explain it in lecture. If you're interested in it uh, and you want to explore it, uh, go ahead. Like some of the TAs and, and some of you probably even uh, do understand that stuff, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, and if you want to explore it and check it out, that's awesome. But you don't have to to be able to get the homework done. Uh, so we want to figure out how that even works. For that, we're going to be in IntelliJ. We're in, in, in IntelliJ all week this week. Uh, so let's use this example and talk about it. So with uh, let's just talk about what this code is. So I have the, uh, this Twitter user class, and I want to be able to send a tweet based on my current mood. So I have this map that stores my mood to the tweet that I want to send if I am experiencing that mood. Uh, that's, uh, that's the behavior I want out of this class. And I have a method to set my mood to any string. And then I'm going to tweet my mood, which should tweet my mood based on that string. I'm going to get my mood out of that, uh, get my tweet out of that hash, that map that we just saw. And if the key is not in that, ha uh, I keep saying hash map, in that map, we're going to use get or default to have a default tweet, which is, I don't know how to feel because I don't even have a, 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 an emotion that's coded in this. Don't even know what to tweet, so you just get the default tweet of, I don't know how to feel. So, uh, so this is the functionality that we want. And uh, by the way, I'll, I'll give my disclaimer right now. Uh, as I'm going through code this, this week and the next two weeks, these three application objective weeks, uh, I'm gonna start showing more, more things. Is that the right way to word it? Uh, I'm gonna start showing things that I wouldn't show earlier in the semester. Uh, I'm going to start pulling out some stops and just showing you like cool tips and tricks that I think will help you that you can use in programming. Uh, this isn't content you need to pass the class. This is where you're earning your A. So these three weeks of material are more geared for the A students who are trying to earn their A. Uh, so for better or worse, that's what um, how I'm going to approach these last few weeks. You're going to see things like final. Final means the variable can't change anymore. This is just like using const in JavaScript. And I like to use const or final or uh, veil in Scala it was, uh, whenever I can, just to make the, you know, just to make my intentions more clear. Hey, this thing shouldn't change. If you try to change it, you're going to get an error. And, uh, and the compiler, I'm told anyway, the compiler should be able to optimize things a little bit more, make my code a little more efficient if I have variables marked as final because it doesn't have to expect that to ever change. It can treat that a little bit differently. So, uh, uh, so we have final, uh, not too different because that's something you've seen in JavaScript. And this, instead of hash map, I keep slipping, the, slipping up and saying hash map because that's what we've been using all semester. But this isn't just a straight up map. This is the map interface. So I have a variable coded to the map, inter, a variable of the type of the interface. Again, tongue-tied on that one. 
And then I'm using this map of entries, which is very similar to the arrays.as list. It's a way to construct a map all in one go. And I want to do that so I can have this final. If I created the map and then did map.put, 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 if I did that, my variable couldn't be final. So I'm combining a few different things to be able to have the kind of code that I want here. So map.of entries, I'm going to give it each entry, each key value store, to be able to create my map. Uh, and this will return something that implements the map interface. And what it's actually going to, we took a look at this in the previous lecture, what it's actually going to create is this immutable collections.mapn, this object, which is an inner class, a static inner class of uh, whatever class we're in, immutable collections. So a decent amount going on, but in, in summary, we're using an interface, leveraging polymorphism to be able to do um, more things, things we couldn't do before. We could do the same thing now that we know what interfaces are. We could do list of, uh, of something. Let me actually show that since we're already on this tangent. Private, static is fine. You know what, I'll still make it final. Uh, if we want to do list, didn't name it. Got to import it. Uh, but we could start doing this thing. Instead of having new array list around our arrays.as list, we can just code to the interface and just use list. As list returns a list. So if I just use list instead of array list for my variable type, I don't care what actual list as list returns. Because as list, I think we, we went into this in one of the lectures earlier. It does, yeah, it does. It does return an array list. But since the return type is list, we can't store it directly in an array list. So when we do this, when we do this, we still have an array list. Numbers is still an array list because we used as list to create it. But we're going to store it in a variable of type list to match the return type so we actually have a valid assignment here. Because even though it's an array list, since this return type is list, that's not a valid assignment. But if we do list, list has most of the methods that ArrayList has. ArrayList implements the list interface and doesn't add much to it and doesn't add anything that we're interested in. So I can just store this in a variable type list and cut down a little bit of code. Um, so it gets a little bit, uh, little bit cleaner. So instead of doing hash map, we would do the same thing here. I believe this works anyway. I haven't tried it. hash map map. So in, we would do the same thing here, new hash map, give it the map, and then have a hash map variable. We could do the same thing here, but it's just cleaner to code to the interface. We're going to code to the map interface, which has all the methods we're interested in anyway, and then, uh, then we don't care what actual type of entries returns. We don't care what type the object actually is. We just know that it implements the map interface. going to happen with the Autolab deadlines? Why? I feel like this wasn't going to be such a big thing, but it keeps coming up. Um, if you were affected by that, at first, you know, send me, in a, send me an email. I'll take a look at it. But uh, uh, Autolab was down for three hours this morning, a little, little bit less than three hours, but three hours this morning. Uh, unfortunately, it was right at the deadline. It should only affect people with last minute panic, trying to get things done right at the last minute, which should be none of you. Why, why is this coming up so much? Uh, but it is still a mistake on our end. Uh, there was, uh, it was a test of the backup generators that apparently the backup generators actually weren't working. The test failed. So all of CSE, the whole CSE server room went down, which included Autolab, of course. Uh, so it wasn't an Autolab issue for what it's worth. But, uh, uh, but it still affected Autolab. So at this point in the semester, like I, I did the recovery opportunities this morning for the homework deadlines. And anybody who needed five recovery opportunities, I just, at this point, I just automatically give the fifth one to anybody who's still trying and still working towards the course. 
So this should only affect students who are trying to get two tests done right at the, you know, this morning. So I guess if that's you, <laughs> let me know. If you thought you were going to get two tests done in three hours, uh, we'll talk. I, I mean, I guess. It is a mistake on our end, so I'll do something for you. But I, I feel weird that it's a thing when I already gave the fifth. Uh, when I already gave the fifth AOs. I guess I could give you an AO back, but I effectively did that by giving, you, giving everyone an extra one. Maybe I'll go to six. I don't know. Uh, Paul and I will have to talk about it, too, to see what, uh, what we should do. Uh, all right, so, uh, so that's what I want. I'm going to set my mood and then tweet that mood. That's what we want this, this uh, code to do. For that, we're going to use an external library. This is part of our pom.xml. I'm going to grab this library here. I have an extra dependency, Twitter 4J. Whenever you see a library that has this 4J on the end, by the way, it just means for Java. It just means it's a Java library. But you're coding in Java, you already know that. So I don't know why they slap that on so many things. I'm sure there's a good reason. Uh, so I'm going to use that library, and I'm going to use this configuration builder, importing these things from that library. This configuration builder, which is going to take some values that I have as constants in a Twitter config class. I've got to be careful with my resizing here when I go into this method. Uh, so this is going to have some constants set, which are going to be my access keys and tokens for the Twitter API. Uh, so if you want to use this code, you'll have to go to the Twitter dev site, go to the API, create an account, create a project, create an app, and then generate your keys uh, to do this, which is, uh, I think, anyway, a more convoluted process than it should be, than it has to be. Uh, but if you want to go through that um, and get all of your tokens and keys and secrets here uh, and add these, then you can use this API. The repo, uh, what I push to the repo, of course, does not have my credentials in it, so you can't, uh, can't use my credentials. But if you want to use this code, set those variables in the config file. And this is a common pattern where you want all of your configuration in one file. So we have code that relies on some configuration, and you might be tempted to just paste your keys and secrets and stuff right in your code. Please don't do that. I mean, I say please, but it, it's going to affect you. It's not going to affect me. Uh, so for your own sake, don't do that. Don't, you don't want to hard code configuration into your project. We like to have all configuration in one place, and usually we would go a step farther. I have this in a Java class. Usually we'd have configuration in a text file, either a YAML or a JSON or uh, even just a plain old text file. Or we would have it in a file using some text format to format our configuration. And then uh, that's where all the configuration for the project will go. And then anywhere where you need to access that configuration, you would read the file, grab the values you need, and then uh, set those values. Or even going a step further and using environment variables. Um, but you don't want to hard code them into your code. One of the pitfalls of that is um, trying to figure out where all of your configuration is. You have, uh, with this project, of course, it's one file. It's not too bad. But if you have, say, even 10 files, and each file is like 100 or 200 lines of code, and each one of those files accesses, accesses different configuration values, Going through all of that code and figuring out everywhere where you have configuration when you want to update that configuration can be tedious. It's more work than you'll want to do. Uh, for configuration, you want to go to one file and update that configuration in one place. If you want to update this code to use your configuration, you just go to this one file after cloning the repo and update your uh, values there. Uh, and especially when the configuration, like in this case, is sensitive information. I don't want anybody having these values. So to make sure that I, I'm not pushing it to the, to the repo or leaking these credentials anywhere, I'm checking this one file, making sure that I don't have this information in that one file when I go to share this code. Makes things a lot easier um, to maintain that way. So once I set all the configuration, on this configuration object, I'm going to use a Twitter factory with this configuration, which is going to return a Twitter factory. 
And then Twitter factory .get instance is going to give me an instance of my actual API, which is just of type Twitter in this library. So that's going to give me the configuration. This, uh, this is the factory pattern. This is a, an OOP thing. It's another, does another, we haven't done one yet. It's a, it's a design pattern. We haven't done one yet. That's next week. Uh, next week, we're going to do the state pattern, which is a, a design pattern using OOP. Uh, Twitter, um, a f the factory pattern is another pattern. And I don't want to get too far down this sidetrack, but I want to go a little bit into it. Uh, is an application of OOP where you have the problem you want to solve with the factory is when you have an, a common API and you want to return an object that implements that API. I shouldn't say API, that's a little, uh, we're overusing that word here. Uh, but you have an interface, and you want to return something that implements that interface, but what actual concrete object you return can be different based on something. In this case, that something is our configuration. So based on what configuration we give this, we might get a different inst uh, an instance of a different class, but whatever it returns will implement the Twitter API, or the Twitter interface. So Twitter here is an interface, and there are multiple different implementations that implement this interface and implement all the methods that we, we want here. And when we get an instance, when we get our instance, when do I want to go in? We're going to get, I haven't dug through this library, so I don't know exactly where to find the good stuff. Uh, Oh, they do. They use a lot of reflection here. It's this is scary stuff. Uh, but it's going to get an instance that implements that Twitter API or that Twitter interface based on what I gave it and what I think, what I assume this library is doing. Let's see if I can find one in here. By the way, look at how much code is in this. How many files and stuff is in this library? This is tons of stuff. Uh, I'm not going to find it in time. But uh, what I assume it's doing is based on the authentication model being used. So since I set these values in my configuration, I'm setting all of my OAuth 2.0 values. So it's going to give me an instance of the Twitter API that authenticates using OAuth 2.0. And, um, and it probably has different authentication methods that it can use depending on what configuration we give it here. Uh, so I'm going to get an instance that has some OAuth 2.0. Actually, we can, I don't, I, I don't want to get too far, but let's check one more thing. I didn't run the right class again. The Twitter impl. So it's a Twitter implementation. <laughs> All right, that's not useful. Uh, but that's the idea of the factory pattern, is you have multiple different types that all implement the same interface, and you don't know which one to return until runtime, until you're ready to actually get the instance of a specific type. OK, so then our code, we set the mood. It's just going to set a state variable. It's just a setter. And then tweet mood, we're going to use the API again. We're first, uh, I already mentioned this line, but we're going to go to our map to be able to get the right tweet that we want to send based on our mood. And we're going to go to our API, call its update status method, and this will fire off the tweet. Firing off a tweet is a dangerous thing. It can throw a Twitter exception. There are a lot of reasons why this can go wrong. One, if the Wi-Fi is down. If I don't have internet access, I can't access the API. Things are going to go bad. It's not going to work. If I hit my rate limit for the API, it's going to reject my request. A lot of things, a lot of different things can go wrong when we're dependent on an external service that uh, we have no control over. Lots of things can go wrong. So we'll catch that exception. I'm just doing the default thing of printing out the stack trace. Um, but if we wanted to handle that some other way, we would uh, do that. So I'm going to create a new Twitter user, set my mood to anticipation. Actually, let's, let's pick a different one. 
Let's go angry. Who's angry today? I'm going to set my mood to angry and then tweet my mood so we would expect to say, why is CC so hard? Can we run this? And nothing happens. And I go to the ye old internet. Go to my profile. You can tell I don't really use Twitter. I just created my handle so I can, uh, so nobody else can steal my name. But I haven't done anything on it until we just tweeted. 19 seconds ago, I tweeted that. So we have Java code that's sending tweets for us. So if you want to use, like, by the way, most sites out there, a lot of sites, I should say, have APIs like this. Go to their documentation, read up on how to use the API, get a library that connects to it, uh, get your credentials, and you can write code that starts interacting with things out there. Uh, so if you want to write a Twitter bot that's going to do, you know, tweet dumb things, um, you know, on the hour or something, I don't know. I don't know what you want to do. Whatever you want to do. You can write a bot that's going to tweet whenever, whatever. You don't actually have to go to Twitter to send a tweet. You just use their API. Most sites, uh, most social media sites, I believe, have open APIs that you can access. You can write code to interact with. You can also use this to get tweets if you want to um, uh, see, a, a, you know, customize your Twitter feed on a separate app and you don't want to go to Twitter. Whatever you want to do. I don't know what you want to do. Whatever your imaginations can, can handle. You can dream up anything, you can code it. Uh, so this interacted with Twitter. We ran this code, sent a tweet. Let's send another one for good measure. Let's... Uh, So joy, feeling good. Refresh too fast. Yeah, baby. So we have code that's going to send tweets for us. So that's what the code does. How the hell do we test it? Testing this is what we want to talk about the rest of the lecture. How in the hell do we test this? Well, you do what we just did, right? You run the code, you head over to Twitter and see if the tweet's there, right? It worked, like I, I'm feeling pretty good that that code worked, right? Uh, but we don't want to do that in general. We don't want to do that. Uh, one. If you're doing a lot of testing, like we tested two of these, but if we want to test all of the moods, make sure everything's working right, uh, and have a few test cases for our default mood, if we have a string that doesn't match any of these moods, that it's going to send this with like empty string, with uh, you know a, a mood that's just not in our map, a few other things. Uh, if we run all those tests, we're going to be cluttering up our Twitter profile. We're going to have a bunch of crap there, and we'll have to go in and delete it, like I do between each and one of these lectures. I go in and delete all the test tweets and uh, the ones I was testing to set this up. So we'd have to go in there and delete all those tweets, uh, which isn't the worst until you have like 100 test tweets. You know, that's going to be tedious to delete. Uh, but also, the API has rate limits. It was this lecture I was talking about rate limits, right? Uh, you're going to start hitting your rate limits. Tw the Twitter API, um, you might have heard the prices went up recently, but you still get like a free number of a uh, API accesses per like day or month. I forget what the, what the thing is. But you get like a couple hundred per whatever, whatever unit of time. If you're using up that rate limit on your test tweets, uh, it, you're going to start getting kicked off of the API just after your testing. Uh, we don't want to start using that either. And in general, whenever you have an external resource like this, you usually, in most cases, don't want to spin it up for testing purposes. So with this, we don't want to actually connect to Twitter during testing. Uh, we, we want to test this code without bugging Twitter or com uh, muddying up our, our Twitter feed, our timeline, and everything. Uh, and for 
like the homework, you have a database, which we could spin up a database, start your database server, and then connect to the database during your testing. But that can be painful, especially if you have an app that has like four different dependencies. What if you have an app that has a web server, sends automated tweets, sends automated emails, and connects to a database? It's four separate services that you have to have running and make sure that they're running properly, make sure you have proper internet connection that's going to be you know, fast enough for your testing purposes. Uh, there's a lot that has to go on just to do testing. So what we want to do is test without any of those services running or without accessing those services. So for your homework, we want to test your code that uses a database without ever running a database. That's what we want to get to for the homework. For Twitter, we want to test our Twitter user code, make sure it's going to send the right tweet based on whatever we set the mood to without actually sending tweets. That's what we want to do. And that's going to be testing with mocks is our goal here. So with testing, it's often, it's often required, I guess, to set up your code in a way that it can be tested before we even start thinking of testing the code. So we want to reconfigure this code to be set up for testing, which, uh, uh, which is a skill that takes a long time to practice, at least in my experience. It takes a long time to practice just writing code the first time that's set up in a way that makes it easy to test the code. One of the big things for that is a word I don't use too often, but something we do all the time, is mod writing modular code or modularization. Uh, this is breaking your code into smaller pieces. Uh, whenever any of us first start programming, when you're first starting, like uh, like all of you are, like I was one day, uh, we have a tendency where if we want to write a project, we're going to write everything in one giant main method. We're going to put all of our code there, we're going to hit go, and then watch our code run, which is practically impossible to test with any automated testing, any good testing practices. So what we start learning and what you start getting good at with experience over time is breaking your code into smaller pieces and putting those pieces in separate functions, separate methods, separate classes, separate files, separate modules, separate packages, splitting your code up and modularizing it so each piece of your code can easily be tested independently and then test if it all comes together the way you want it to in the end by running the thing. Uh, uh, so, that's what, uh, so that's one thing we want to do. We've been doing that all semester just by default. Like the ha homework handouts are write a method that does this, write a method that does this, write a class that does this. I never said write a, an entire program with these features because we want to make sure it's split up in a way that you can test it. This one is not split up that way. We have a few methods, sure, but these methods depend on, at least the tweet mood method depends on the API. So to get this, to start getting this set up, for our testing, because for testing, the first thing we would do is Twitter user, user equals new Twitter user, user dot set mood happy, user dot tweet mood. This is going to send a tweet to Twitter. We check Twitter, see if the tweet's there, and if it, you know, if it is, we're happy, if we're not, you know, we got debugging to do. Uh, now we could actually access the API again. The API has methods where we can access our tweets, so we could access our tweets and check the last tweet. Like, we could actually automate that. Uh, it gets tricky because when we tweet the mood, as soon as this method call ends, our code's gonna run the next line of code, access the API, check our timeline, get the most recent tweet, and make sure it's the one we expect. But Twitter might not have updated everything in that time. Our code's gonna run in like less than a millisecond. Uh, that update might not have propagated through all of Twitter to get that tweet available to everybody quite yet. It might take half a second for that to happen. Uh, so we would have some timing issues here, even if we did wanna automate it with the actual API. We would have some tricky testing to write. It can be done, but again, it's gonna muddy up your, your profile. So what we want to do is get this set up so we can test and then test it. So the first thing I want to do here is get all of the Twitter API code out of this method. I'm going to, or out of this class. So I'm going to create a new class for the Twitter API. 
and I'm going to take all of this code out of here. Anything that interacts with the Twitter API is going in a separate class. And then whenever I need to connect to Twitter, I'm never coding that in Twitter user. I'm going to go to that object that I'm creating and have that object do the actual Twitter stuff. So I'm going to say, hey, Twitter API, can you connect to Twitter for me? And then that code is going to do the thing. We have this. I'm going to call this a public send tweet method, uh, which returns void. That should be everything. And then at this point, I should be able to get rid of all of my dependencies. I shouldn't have any dependence on that library in this code. And that's what I want. I want this code to be my code. And then whenever this code needs to do Twitter stuff, uh, oh, that's my main method. I'm going to delete that so I don't get confused again. So whenever I want this code to connect to the Twitter API, I'm going to create private final Twitter API semicolon. Oh, I have to name it. I'm just going to call it API. This dot API equals new Twitter API. This dot API dot send tweet. So I got all that code out of here. And I'm going to defer to this object whenever I want functionality that connects to Twitter. And this object is going to control all of that actually interacting with the Twitter API code. So this gets us part of the way there. And we're going to take a pretty big leap next. So anybody, does anybody have questions? The only question was about Autolab deadlines. Anybody have questions about this stuff before we take the next big leap? Okay. I'm going to change this a little bit. Instead of having this Twitter API class with all the functionality, I'm still going to have this. But I'm going to swap this out. I'm going to call this real Twitter. And instead of this Twitter API being an actual class, I'm going to turn this into an interface and leverage some OOP goodness. So this API, or API, this API, but interface, this interface defines what I can access with the Twitter API. And for our purposes here, all I want to be able to do is send a tweet. So the Twitter API is going to have the send tweet method, and that's it. It says everything that implements me needs to have a send tweet method, and I don't care what else you have. That's what this API, this interface is saying. And then real Twitter is going to implement the Twitter API. And implement that send tweet method, which is actually going to send a tweet to Twitter. Now in my Twitter user, I can't say new Twitter API anymore because Twitter API is an interface. So instead, I want to set this up in a little bit different way. So with this, we still have, like, we got all the Twitter API, the library code, out of this method, but we're still dependent on it. We're going to create a new real Twitter, you know, and then uh, this code has to connect to the Twitter API 100%. It always has to. But what we're going to do instead, moving forward, is something called, and Paul hates that I'm using this term, 
uh, we're going to use something called dependency injection. He says, don't use that term. That's too much of a mouthful. Everybody's going to get confused by it. I think y'all can handle it. We're going to use something called dependency injection. So instead of hard coding our dependency and saying Twitter user uses the real Twitter class or the Twitter API class when it was still a class, not an interface, instead of hard coding that and saying this class uses this other class, instead we're going to say this class uses this interface, this Twitter API interface, and what the actual dependency is, we're going to inject at runtime. So when we want to use the Twitter user, we're going to give it a reference to real Twitter. And that way, whatever we give it, we can give it anything that implements the interface. But if we give it an instance of real Twitter, it's going to have the dependency that actually interacts with Twitter.com, with the Twitter API. If we run this, let's uh, pick another mood here. I think I did good on the interview and quiz. Just to verify that we're still running. So we didn't change any functionality yet. This code does exactly the same thing. All we did was a bunch of extra work is all we did so far. But we're getting our code set up for the big payoff. Hey, all right, I passed the interview and quiz. So now that we're injecting our dependency, instead of hard coding it, the advantage to this, again, we didn't do anything yet. The advantage is what we're about to do. I'm going to create a new class, importantly, in my testing package, which is going to be my mock implementation. This implementation is going to implement the Twitter API. I don't get autocomplete on that. I'm going to implement the Twitter API, and then in my testing, I'm going to use my mock Twitter, which is going to be a fake implementation of the Twitter API. So mock Twitter, let's just for now print out the tweet. And now when we run our test code, with this mock implementation, we're not accessing the Twitter API. This is going to allow us to still to test our Twitter user code to make sure we're sending the right tweet with the right mood without actually sending those tweets. So we're using our mock implementation. We can see the tweet that would have been sent right here. And, uh, and, and that's it. Like it. It doesn't actually access the API. So we can use this for testing without using the API itself. Same idea with the homework. We can implement a mock database that implements the same API as the real database and then use that for testing without actually having to spin up a database or connect to a database at all. So this is what we want to do, is get our mock implementation. And, and this is fine, but it's still not automated. Uh, this is like one of the very first examples I, of testing I showed you in week two of the semester where I said, we could just print things to the screen and verify with our eyeballs that it's fine. Uh, but that's tedious as all hell. I don't want to do that. So we still want to automate this to be able to get our testing, uh, to be able to test the way that we like to with unit testing. So let's take this one step further. Instead of printing the tweet here, I'm going to take advantage of the fact that this is a class. Like, I, I implement the Twitter API, which means I have to have a send tweet method that takes a string and returns void. But since it's a class, I can also do anything else. I can have instance variables. I can have a constructor. I can have uh, other helper methods. I can do whatever I want here. And when you, create your, when you create your mock implementation, make sure it is in your tests package in your homework. Uh, this is, um, this is a, a common thing to do in practice. Anything that 
is only used in your testing. The only reason we would ever create this class is for testing. We're not going to create this for, uh, for production. We're not going to release our code with this, with this uh, our project with this code in it. This is only for testing, so we put it in with the rest of our testing code. And then when you go to deploy, you usually want to rip out all of your testing code and all testing dependencies. Like when we go to deploy an app, we're not going to deploy it with JUnit because that's just extra stuff that's in the, with the project uh, that we don't really want to send. So when we go to deploy, we're going to delete all of our tests and then deploy. So anything that's specifically for testing goes in your test package. And Autolab will check this. Autolab, when it tests your test, will delete all of your code except for your test package. So if your mock implementation is outside of that test package, it's going to get deleted, and then your test are ran, which uses your mock implementation, and then everything breaks. So make sure it's in your test package for real-world reasons and for Autolab reasons. It's just a good idea to do that. Uh, so, I can, so I can do anything I can do with the class. And by the way, since this class is going to be in your test package, it will exist for all of your tests, even when it's testing other solutions, the correct and incorrect. So you can do, you have full freedom to do whatever you want in this mock class. You could even have public instance variables, which I won't do, but uh, you could have any methods you want, anything. You can check the state, something we have, don't, can't do in most of our tests. We can only test the methods and uh, access the values that way. Here we can check the instance variables themselves if you want. Whatever you want to do with this. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna store two pieces of information in instance variables. Because what I want to do is test this method, uh, not test this method, but test this method's usage. So when I call tweet mood, depending on what I set my mood to, I'm expecting a very certain tweet to be sent, or more specifically, I'm expecting a send tweet to be called exactly once, and I expect it to be called with a specific tweet. As long as this method is called the right number of times, I'm not saying too many tweets or too few tweets, and it's called with the right argument that I'm expecting, then I'm confident that my code is doing what it's supposed to be doing, as long as it calls that method. And then as far as testing the real Twitter, this code itself, not a whole lot we can do without connecting to the API, but we sent three tweets. Like I'm confident that this code is actually sending tweets to my account. So we're comfortable with what this code is doing. So now, if we can verify that this code is always sending the right tweet based on mood by calling this method with the right argument, then we can be confident that the whole thing is going to come together and do what it's supposed to do when we go to deploy this project. So with that in mind, I'm going to keep track of the number of tweets that were sent be explicit here. And the latest tweet that was sent out. So if I keep track of these two pieces of information, I can do everything I want to do in my testing. There are a lot of different ways to set this up. You wouldn't have to set it up this way exactly. Um, but this way, uh, I get all the information I need with nothing extra. If you wanted and then uh, let me finish this, actually, before I finish what I'm saying. Uh, tweet sent plus plus. This uh, latest tweet equals tweet. So I'm going to have this class remember the information about this method call. And then I'll access these values in my test to make sure the method was called with the right arguments. Uh, let me get some getters here. Uh, so you could set this up a different way. For example, every time send tweet is called, you could add that tweet to an array list of tweets and store every single tweet that was ever sent. That'll be perfectly fine too. That would work. Uh, that would work excellent. It would store all the information, and you can check where these tweets sent in this order and no extra tweets. You can do that as well. Um, I just decided to set it up this way. It doesn't mean that's the solution. It's just a way to set this up. And then when I go to test my code, I'm not going to do this new mock Twitter right in the constructor call anymore. 
for one very specific reason, is that I need a reference to it. Call it Mac. So I'm still going to pass it to my constructor. So Twitter user is going to have this Mac implementation, but I need a reference to it so I can check its state in my testing. So before we do anything, I can do some sanity checks. I'm going to get the number of tweets that were sent and make sure that no tweets were sent. I want to make sure this constructor isn't sending tweets for some reason. And assert equals, I think I just set it to empty string. Let's set it to some, some value. Get the latest tweet that was sent. It should still be whatever default value I set it to. And if I set my mood, we have relief. So I'll look up in my, oops. I look up in my map, I expect one tweet to be sent after that call. Let me look up what relief was so I can get the exact wording. I'm going to cut and paste it to make sure I don't make any mistakes. And then if I do a mood that's not in my map at all, I'll get the default tweet. So if I'm feeling super good, I'm going to get my default tweet. And two tweets would have been sent by now. Then we can keep going with this. We can test every single mood, but you know, you get the idea by now. Run this test, and now we can test our code without actually sending any more tweets. Now we're, we green barred. We could add the rest of our tests and really feel good about our code. Make sure that it is sending the right tweets by mocking out the Twitter implementation with a fake implementation and then using that fake implementation to test our code. Any really quick questions on that? We got right to the end. Good stopping point. Everyone feeling all right about this? Ready to do on the homework? Sounds good. No complaints is good, right?